Hi, everyone. Um, I still see people kind of slowly filtering in. Um, but my introduction, my spiel kind of at the beginning here is pretty long. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. And hopefully by the time I end that and introduce Stephen Ryan, um, things can get started and, and everyone will be in place for this conversation. Um, welcome to this Montana Book Festival event featuring Ryan Busey and former governor of Montana, Steve Bullock here to talk about Ryan's brand new book, Gunfight, My Battle Against the Industry That Radicalized America. This event is sponsored by a number of different organizations and businesses, including Arts Missoula, MissoulaEvents.net. Our collector's edition sponsor tonight is the Whitefish Review, um, also Humanities Montana, and the Dennis and Phyllis Washington Foundation. An enormous thank you to all of our sponsors and supporters um, during the 2021 festival. We could not have pulled this off without you. My name is Lauren Korn. I'm the director of the Montana Book Festival. I am zooming in from my office in the Mountain Press Publishing Company building here, again, in Missoula, Montana. The Montana Book Festival acknowledges that we are on the Aboriginal territories of the Salish and Kalispell people. The name Missoula comes from the Bitterroot Salish word in Mizuletko, which means place of freezing water. This name has been used for over 12,000 years since the existence of Glacial Lake Missoula. The first Europeans who came here borrowed the Salish term in Mizzoulitko and modified the word to Missoula. Later, when Glacial Lake Missoula melted, the Bitterroot Salish began using an additional term for Missoula, which means place of the small bull trout. In 1855, the Bitterroot Salish were forced to sign the Hellgate Treaty, and following this treaty, the United States government carried out forced assimilation, removal, and genocide against the Salish and other peoples in their efforts to acquire land. Yet despite centuries of colonial theft and oppression, the Tutiakin people are still here and thriving in their, on their Aboriginal lands. Pardon. The Montana Book Festival strives, and we will continue to strive to help promote Indigenous voices as one of the ways our organization acknowledges and respects the Aboriginal peoples of Missoula. For those of you zooming in from outside Missoula, I encourage you to let us know where you're zooming in from. Um, go ahead and throw those locations into the chat and we can see kind of where our, our audience is, is coming in from. Um, and a few logistics before uh, I turn things over to Ryan and Steve tonight. I'd like, I'd like to invite you as audience members, attendees, to submit your questions to them via the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. You'll notice there's a Q&A and there's a chat. Um, please direct any questions specifically for Ryan or Steve to the Q&A and then use the chat again to throw out your location, to post comments. Um, I'll be throwing out some links. Um, and engaging you in that space, but questions directly should be in the Q&A. They'll be um, probably uh, addressed at the, during the last 10 minutes or so, but I think Steve is planning on maybe taking a look at the hour as well. Um, on the back end of things, I will be monitoring, monitoring both the Q&A and the chat um, for any logistical questions you have about this conversation or about the Montana Book Festival, any of that. Um, so I'll be, I'll be active there. Um, I do want to also note that if you're interested in purchasing Ryan's book, Gunfight, you can do so through our festival bookseller, which is Fact and Fiction Books here in Missoula, Montana. Uh, you can go into the brick and mortar store or you can purchase online at factandfictionbooks.com. Please be sure to use the code MBF at checkout. Um, any, any MBF coded sales, 20% uh, of that comes back to the festival so that we can continue our literary programming um, online and hopefully eventually in person. Um, with that introductory spiel out of the way, I would like to introduce uh, our featured guest tonight. Ryan Busey is a former firearms executive who helped build one of the world's most iconic gun companies and was nominated multiple times by industry colleagues for the prestigious Shooting Industry Person of the Year Award. Ryan is an environmental advocate who served in many leadership roles for conservation organizations, including as an advisor for the United States Senate, Sportsman's Caucus, and the Biden presidential campaign. He remains a proud outdoorsman, gun owner, father, and resident of Montana. Welcome, Ryan. And Steve Bullock is an American politician and lawyer that served as the 24th governor of Montana from 2013 to 2021. Born in Missoula, Montana, Bullock graduated from Claremont McKenna College and Columbia Law School. And prior to serving in elected office, he had jobs, uh, his jobs included Montana Assistant Attorney General, Attorney in Private Practice, Adjunct Instructor at George Washington University Law School, and Tour Boat Captain on the Missouri River. Bullock enjoys all things outdoors, hiking, fishing, hunting, 
and running. A uh, huge Montana Book Festival, welcome to you both. Steve, oh, there you go, there you go. Hi, <laughs> good to see you both. And thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm gonna hand things over to you to get started. Great, hey, thanks, thanks Lauren. Uh, thank all of you for joining us tonight. If Lauren is zooming in from Missoula, I'm here in Helena at our home. Um, and it's great though to have you all spend in our, your Saturday night with us. Um, look, I'm at a little bit of an advantage here. I have known Ryan for quite some time, eight, 10 years, and I've also had the chance to read his book. So on the one hand, I think all of you probably, if you're on this this evening, know something about the book, but not going too deep uh, because you sure as heck got better buy it. But just as an introduction, Ryan, tell us a little bit about what this year book's all about. Yeah, so <clears throat> thanks. It's an honor to be here tonight. Um, very, like I've always been so blown away and impressed with the, with the literature that comes out of Montana. Um, you know, there are just so many iconic titles and writers and people and stories. And um, it's it feels quite humbling for me to be sitting here tonight um, at the Montana Book Festival. So kind of a dream come true. The, the book is about my life. It's my memoir. It's my family story. Um, I obviously, I, I grew up a ranch kid, got into the firearms industry, spent 25 years as an executive in the firearms industry, helped build uh, an iconic company um, and, you know, was uh, operated at the very highest levels of the firearms industry. And, um, this, so the story is about my life and my family's life in a narrow lens sort of way. And in a wide lens sort of way, the book kind of alternates back and forth between the narrowness of what is happening to me and my family. And then in a wide lens, what is happening to our country. So um, I, I think I'll leave it there and, and we can, we can jump off from there. Yeah. And, and tell me a little bit about uh, growing up because it wasn't in Montana, it was in Kansas, but and your exposure to guns and firearms, because I think that's something that uh, a lot of Montanans would certainly have an understanding of too. Yeah. So I think I grew up like a lot of Montana farm and ranch kids. Um, and I grew up just East of Denver in the high plains, you know, our ranch sets at 3,600 feet. So it's, it's a high plains ranch, much like of, you know, Eastern Montana. Um, and I grew up with a rifle in one hand and uh, a, a shotgun in the other, almost literally. And, and I speak about in the book how guns were such a central part of our lives. They were both a tool and, um, you know, and, and something that we that represented the best parts of our lives, hunting with my dad, shooting with my brother, um, all those sorts of things. And so I, I think, you know, in the early parts of the book, one of the sort of byproducts of the book that I wanted to accomplish was that I think a lot of, you know, pejorative here, right, air quotes, coastal elites often don't understand how it is that people in, in flyover country, uh, you know, or, or rural areas of, um, of the coast can be so attached to guns. And so I try to explain that in the first few chapters about how, you know, I state that, that guns really came to represent for us things we wanted to be true, things we wish to be true. Um, and, you know, I think about nobody gets their, like a gun is a tool, right? But nobody gets their hammer out, you know, the night before hammer season and looks at it and says, boy, what fun times I'm going to have with that hammer. But we do that with our guns, right? And so I think that sort of cultural, emotional connection is really an important part of this, part of this book because it's that connection it's that deep, visceral sort of, you know, you know, connection to the things that we love. It's when we have those things, there we're we're open to them being twisted, and so that that leads into much of the rest of the book. And uh, look, a lot of us love guns as a kid, but some people say I might want to be a police officer, a fireman. Not necessarily. I want to get into the industry, yeah. and sort of what both drove you to get into the industry, but also like in the gloss, you know, at the start talking about the book in your life, you said, yeah, I rose fairly high. Talk a little bit about that career and some of the awards too. Yeah. So I, 
you know, when I um, graduated from college, I thought about going to law school and I thought better of it. Although my wife, who is a hero in the book, tells me I would have made a very good attorney. And I don't think she means that in a good way. Um, so, but I, you know, getting into the firearms industry for me, even though the, the pay was very paltry, um, was, was kind of like making the major leagues as a kid that plays baseball. And I played baseball too. And so, you know, I thought what better thing to do than be around something that I love um, and I had this sort of romantic vision about what it would be. And, you know, there's some pretty wild stories in the beginning parts of the book that um, they don't quite match up to what you, you might think <laughs> you might you might think it, it might be right. But at, as the industry was growing and I was helping grow our company, um, Kimber is the company I work for. And, and it, it grew into a, a very, very influential company, a high end, um, you know, very powerful brand. And I also cared about a lot of stuff. And so I operated in the highest levels of the NRA and the NSSF. And I knew, you know, the most powerful people by their first names. I was nominated several times for the Industry Person of the Year Award, which Bill Ruger won that award. Wayne LaPierre won that award. Charlton Heston won that award. I mean, I could go on and on. And so I was fortunate enough to, to operate at those levels. But there came a point when operating at those levels didn't mean what I thought it would mean as a kid. Right. And so I was having problems. I was having a lot of second guesses about what the industry was becoming and what it was standing for. And I ended up using a lot of the street cred granted to me through those awards and, and, and through my friends and through the high level operation that I did to fight against some of what I think, you know, to jump ahead, I guess the, the sort of through line of the book is that I live through the development of our modern toxic politics. Um, sort of Trump and Trumpism in the last three or four or five years was really no surprise to me because I operated in the kitchen where this was all cooked up. So I started having a lot of problems with that. Yeah, so growing up, uh, the NRA it was sort of a gun safety. It was a hunting, it was a shooting organization. Now this is my words, not yours. If that's what it was for me growing up, now it's a political organization in part uh, to do nothing more than drive us apart. Yeah. What, from your perspective, was the motive or the impetus for the NRA change? And did the NRA change politics or did politics change the NRA? Um, I'll take that second one first because I've been asked this sort of question um, about the book. And I obviously wrestle with this causal question, really, which is what you're asking, right? Um, I believe that a very few sources in our, in our country radicalized our politics. And I believe that the NRA and by extension, the shooting industry is one of those. I don't, I don't think it's the other way around, right? Because to believe it's the other way around, you have to think that American people just sitting around in a Petri dish decided on their own to become radicalized. I don't, I don't believe that's true. I, I, I think more of people than that. I do think there are very nefarious sources that tapped into the sort of cultural connections that we talked about earlier with guns. And then I don't, I don't know that it was purposeful to begin with, but there came a time when people at very high levels of politics saw the sort of potential in that. And it, and it was no longer about conservation or hunting or safety or camaraderie or all the things that my dad and my grandfather, you know, I tell the story in the book about the sort of magazine, my, I mean, my grandfather, his favorite hat, he was a very proud Roosevelt Democrat. Um, and I tell the story about his favorite hat was his black and gold NRA, you know, block gold letters NRA hat. But NRA to him didn't mean what NRA today means. Um, my father was an NRA member up into the early 90s when he told him never to call again. But, um, you know, in, in the magazines that my my brother and I read in, in our house growing up as a kid, they never we never had to read about the impending demise of the republic because Black Lives Matter rallies were going to ruin our cities. I, I never read about that. I read about like, you know, shooting competitions and old guns and new shotguns. Like that's the sort of stuff that were in those magazines. So if you just look at the history, maybe of the NRA magazines, you can kind of see the sort of foreboding 
political toxicity that was on our way. Now, your first part of your question about what did it, I think as, as our country ratcheted up, as quarterly capitalism ratcheted up, as pressure for power and money ratcheted up, um, there were a few things in our country that could be tapped in to do this sort of single-minded devotion to, you know, to all or nothing politics. And it happened to be guns were one of those, again, because of the cultural connections we talked about. But if I can think about my time in public office, um, look, I led the state's efforts to make sure that the Second Amendment was recognized as an individual right when I was Attorney General. Uh, the first time that I ran for office, I think the NRA stayed out of it. I literally had, because I had connections when I was AG at times, did have some Republican legislators calling me saying, can you help us on some issues along the way? And I think of even my 12 years, four years as attorney general and eight years as governor, of the changes in the NRA. And was that driven to sell more from your perspective or is this beyond sort of either the book or your? No, it's an accidental thing. And I think you're exactly right. Like I tell the story in the book of me selling you a rifle. Um, I remember you texting me pictures of you and Cam yeah. with a mule deer you shot, right? But it got to the point where that's not enough that you're not pro gun. If you do that, like you're, a, you know, if you're not 100% committed, then you're 0% committed. Does that sound anything similar to what the modern politics on the right are? I mean, do you know anybody in, in the Republican party who's 99% for Trump? I don't, there's only zero or a hundred. Yeah. And so if you think about all of the, the facts that you just stated about your career and the facts about your personal life, right? We were joking about that it's opening weekend and I was hunting today and you're going hunting tomorrow. And, but that's not enough. You're not pro gun when you do that because our country has got to a place where you can never be pro gun enough. Literally you can never. So if you're not, if you don't believe that there should literally be zero regulations on guns anytime, anywhere, no matter what, then you're not pro gun enough. Um, very much like, again, that's foreshadowing what our modern politics are. Yeah, I'll never forget. So I was in the White House literally the week after uh, the Parkland shooting. Mm -hmm. And it was all the governors, Democrats and Republicans. And as President Trump spoke to us, he said to the governors, and at the time, I think he was talking about universal background checks, but he said, I don't know why you governors are so afraid of the NRA. And a week later, any sort of thoughts of movement at all went away. Um, should governors, should elected officials be afraid of the NRA right now? I think, uh, boy, that's a complicated question. I think they are afraid of the NRA, right? I think, um, but it's, it's, we have empowered a radicalized vocal minority and it's sort of the tyranny of the minority, right? We see this, I mean, this is why voting rights are such an issue um, because it's all about maintaining the tyranny of the minority. Do I think we should be, a, do I think politicians should be afraid? Um, it's, it's not my place to, to sort of, you know, coach about what voting patterns are gonna be, which is, as, as you know, Governor, these are things you have to worry about when you're running campaigns. Um, I think afraid is the wrong word. I, I, I do, and this, this will get sort of to the end of the book, but I do believe that we are at a time when the moderates have, we're very close to have saying, okay, I've had it, this is enough. I mean, when people march on Washington DC and our Capitol with a couple different types of flags, Trump and MAGA flags. And then if you didn't notice, AR-15 come and take it flags. They weren't barbecue grills. They weren't Nike shoes. They weren't your favorite car. They were come and take it flags. When people show up at the Michigan Capitol and threaten lawmakers, when people show up at the Kentucky Capitol armed to the teeth and threaten lawmakers and the Virginia Capitol. And my book opens with armed people in Kalispell at the Black Lives Matter rally in Kalispell threatening my son. Um, that was a tough thing for me to take. I think that moderate gun owners are at a point where they're where they're ready to say okay i'm a gun owner but i'm not that kind of gun owner 
I'm, I'm done with it. So I guess the answer to your question is probably politically, they have been afraid. I hope we're headed towards a time when they no longer need to be afraid. Talk a little bit about that rally. And also, though this is two completely different things, uh, also because you kind of glossed over that what finally caused the break for you? Well, so I'll get to that. I'll talk about the rally first. Um, I had made up my mind to leave the industry and um, my family and I wanted to show up here in Kalispell. And it, and it, frankly, it was very heartening, unbelievable. Something I never thought I would see somewhere between a thousand and 1500 people, a lot of high school kids, a lot of young people at that Black Lives Matter rally in June, 2020. And um we showed up there and I knew we had been emailed alerts about the degree to which armed counter protesters would be there. And I had a lot of trepidation about the, about the potential for violence. There are just so many things could go wrong. I mean, and there were, there were probably, there were between a hundred and 120 armed protesters, most of them with tactical vest, tactical gear, AR 15s, 30 round magazines, loaded rifles, I mean, you name it, right? And so, I mean, to me, this just felt like a whole bunch of open gasoline with matches flying everywhere. Like I, I, I could just, I could just feel that it could explode at any time. And initially, when I walked through this crowd, I was both heartened by all of these kids who were trying to do the right thing in a country that needs a lot more right things, and um, and at the same time, it was as if I was walking through a grocery store, like like I was in the macaroni and cheese business, right? And you walk in and you're like, wow, look, there's the macaroni and cheese that I made. It's up there on the shelf and that's my product. Well, that's what these, that's what these guys were. It, it felt, and they were all guys. It felt like to me, um, my God, like my industry has empowered this. My industry has made this. This is, these are now our avatar customers. And I tell the story in the book about how over time, the customers went from people that, talked about things that you and I have been talking about, about guns here on this conversation, Steve, to this sort of overt, weird machismo, tactical, you know, the sort of things we see now, the sort of intimidation with guns. And that was very, very difficult for me to take. Um, I felt very guilty about that and still feel very guilty about that. And I think it's, it's a dangerous, it's a very dangerous thing for our country. What was finally the breaking point, the time to change? Yeah, sorry, that was the second part of your question. So um, there, I guess the, the, the real breaking point was um, my wife, Sarah, you know, shoving a pen in my hand and saying, write down the things you're going to do to leave and write this book. Um, that, was the, that was like the physical breaking point, right? That happened on our 20th wedding anniversary, um, which I did. And, and literally the next we got home, we were fishing in Fernie, British Columbia. We were fly fishing just across the border here. Um, and when we came back the next Monday, I started, I, th those five things on that list, I started doing them, got up every morning, started writing this book at, you know, three thirty, four o'clock in the morning. It, like there were four things I was going to do. I did them all. Um, but I would say that probably the most sort of jarring thing for me is that um, the SHOT Show, which is the large industry trade show, one of the largest trade shows in the world happened on in 2017. The last day of SHOT Show happened to correspond with the inauguration day with Trump's inauguration. And I witnessed then something that I never thought I would see. And that is um, the entire show, tens of thousands of people that like, it's like, if you're looking above it, right, it's like amps, like it's totally frenetic, great big booth, huge two-story booth, guns everywhere, products everywhere. Um, and as I walked through the show early that morning, I noticed flat screen TVs everywhere being tuned to the same station. And as Trump was inaugurated and gave what, we, what would uh, end up being called the American carnage speech, I also noticed that um, everything came to a stop and that the audio was piped in through the um, loudspeaker, through the, you know, through the sound system, audio system of the entire convention center, millions of square feet. And as if everybody was the same, as if everybody's politics were identical, I mean, there were people from Spain and Germany and, but, and, you know, obviously people like me who had very different political views than this, but the point was, you're all in the same church. You all believe the same way. This is good. You know, and I, I just thought, my God, what have we done to this country? And 
I thought we had done, I thought we had done some things that were likely pretty bad. Um, I didn't know how bad they would be, but I remember coming home. Those of you who travel in and out of Montana know that um, flights from just about anywhere afternoon typically get home at midnight, right? Um, that's the way Kalispell flights are. I snuck in, threw my bags in, tried to tried to crawl into bed without waking Sarah up, and she woke up for a minute and said, "You know how was it?" And I said, "I can't do this shit anymore." And that started the process of a you know two and a half three year span of me getting out. The uh, <clears throat> she talks sort of a two and a half three year span of getting out. Uh, someone posted a question. Um, people are asking, does this book take down the gun industry or is it about the author's battle against the industry? The author spent his career and presumably created his financial wealth while inside it and only recently after retirement started his fight against it. Please discuss. I think those are good questions. Um, or that's, you know, it's a good, <laughs> it's a good hard hitting question and intelligent question. And um, I'll try to answer them quickly. The book is the truth about my life and the truth about what happened to the country. It's not a takedown or praise. It's just the truth of why we're here. Um, and it's not an anti-gun book because I'm not anti-gun. I still hunt. I still shoot with my boys. I still, but it, but it is an anti-radicalization book. And it is the story of how we were radicalized. I think that the, the conundrum for the, for the writer of this question is, okay, you're doing this and you spent 25 years inside of it. It's something doesn't jive for me, right? Well, it, I didn't partake in, in fact, many of the trends that you see now in the industry troubled me greatly and I fought against them. In fact, I did my best. I picked every, every opportunity I could to push back against some of these trends. I, you know, my company and I fought hard. We never built AR-15s, assault rifles. Um, we didn't build cheap polymer frame pistols. We did the, the, the sort of things that- um, Even I though believed, there was pressure to do so at times. Right? Yeah, there was a lot of pressure, but I believed myself to be different. And I still believe that not all guns are the same. And I think um, one way I'm going to answer this question is be careful not to lump all gun owners into a place where they all believe in this thing that the NRA says they believe in, because I can tell you that they don't. Um, I was in the industry for a long time, and I certainly didn't. Did I make my livelihood from the firearms industry? Yes, I did. Um, did I believe I was different? Did I fight for things that were right? Did I try to keep it from going off the rails? Did I eventually fail at that and and write this book about it? Yes, but I never I never stopped fighting. And the book is about the sort of knife's edge existence that I lived for 15 years because I wasn't always like this. I got into the business sort of mindless flyover kid, talk radio, consumer of talk radio as a young kid on a tractor. And, and I, I was, I was thoughtless about my politics. And when I figured out that um, I could no longer be thoughtless about my politics, I put my shoulder into fighting against the industry and about, and against it gobbling up things that I think are sacred, including our democracy now. And, and the book is about my knife's edge existence, trying to do that. Yeah. And, and Ryan, I, I know it's not like, all right, you retired and said, okay, now let's try to figure out some way to make money off of retirement. It was a difficult choice along the way as you saw things change. Now, similarly though, to like, look, I've, some of my most enjoyable fundraisers in 2016 were when <laughs> your wife, Sarah, and you hosted, I had two of them at your house mm -hmm. um, and still have some of the stuff that you wrote during that <laughs> don't let that top we 10 list out but, you tonight but that top but, 10 list is a little dicey yeah, yeah. like i've always <laughs> you know i've known you to be active in democratic politics but you didn't always think of yourself as a democrat like what made that happen so you know when i grew up as a kid um that was the in the eighties was sort of the birth of right wing talk radio. Right. And uh, any kid that grew up on a ranch or farm can tell you driving around in circles in a field or driving a truck um, like AM radio is about all you got. And I, and, I, and it influenced me and not in a good way. And, and I went to college and I guess I was a gifted student there, but I was sort of a contrarian, but I wasn't really thoughtful about it. And, but I fit right into the gun industry because I, I sort of generally thought of myself as a Republican 
And I laughed at sort of the bumper sticker politics. I tell the story in the book about me driving into Kalispell one of early time at a stoplight. And I saw a bumper sticker on the back. There's some very ugly ones these days, but this one, not that this one's great, but it said liberals one a day or limit one a day, three in possession, you know, like it's a, like, like they're a duck. Right. And I thought, Oh, that's great. You know, that was sort of the level at which I considered my politics, very simple bumper sticker, thoughtless. What eventually turned the tide is in 2002, three and four, as the Bush and Cheney administration started to, um, started to aggressively ramp up um, industrialization, oil and gas industrialization in some of our last wild places in the country, including the Val Vidal in New Mexico, the Rhone Plateau in Colorado, and the place that became my sacred home, the Badger II Medicine in Montana. The book opens, by the way, the, the young boy, uh, my young son who was attacked in that first scene is named Badge. He's named after the Badger II Medicine. But um, our other son is named Lander after Lander, Wyoming. Um, what really turned it for me is once when the Badger was set to be industrialized, industrialized with oil and gas drilling and, and Cheney was pushing that, I was recruited by Trout Unlimited and a few other conservation organizations because I was sort of this contrarian type. I, I, I worked in a conservative industry. You know, I knew what the press hook would be, right? So I, I went to Washington, D.C. and did a press conference at the National Press Club standing up in favor of these wild places and um, really criticizing leading up, to the, or leading up to the election. I would really criticize the Bush-Cheney administration about these plans. And I thought... On one hand, naively, I thought, look, I'm just standing up for places where hunters use guns, right? And I'm, I'm a hunter. I've sold lots of guns. Really, can I be attacked for this? And the degree to which I was attacked afterwards, of course, you know, the press hook found its mark. I was, I, there were stories in the LA Times. We were on the front page of the Washington Post. I was quoted in the Denver Post. There was a story in the Seattle paper. I mean, I don't know. There were probably 20, 30 papers. Um, and you know, the, the very higher ups in the industry all came for me and my job. Um, they attacked me vociferously. And I thought, all I'm doing is standing up for places where people hunt. And you're, but the point was the scales fell from my eyes there, right? It wasn't about anything that we had been told it was about. It was just for naked partisan power, period, end of story. And that, like, if you're going to attack me, somebody who sells sells guns for the living, who hunts as much as they can as some sort of anti-gun stalwart. Like to, I look back at it now. I'm like, I was just kind of like the, the hockey player on the ice. Who's ready to go. Right. You just throw down your gloves. Like, okay, let's go. And 2004 from then on, this is what I've been doing. So uh, you and I have been at public lands rallies and like really trying to make sure. And the threat is still real of public lands transfer, but that's always been one to me that can be a great unifier, right? Yep. That we may not all agree. We may have different philosophies. You might be a fly fisherman. You might be a bait fisherman. You might be a snowmobiler. You might be a cross country skier, but there's a unity of interest there. And presumably the circle of public lands and the circle of people that care about their guns ought to be pretty darn close for all those that use them for hunting, not just for self-defense. And instead it's become just the complete wedge issue. Can yeah. we ever fix that? Do you think? I think the only way we can fix it is to admit the truth, to understand the truth that's in my book. And the reason it's a wedge issue is because the firearms industry, the NRA and the NSSF have made it a wedge issue. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure you noticed, Governor, in a recent Senate campaign here where one candidate was attacked as some sort of anti-gun, anti-hunting, God only knows what yeah. candidate, and the other one was held up as some prince when, you know, obviously I'm speaking about you, but... Yeah, a um, little too close to home, but go on, Ryan. Yeah, but <laughs> sorry about that. But, but the point here is that obviously... In, in the environment and conservation don't mean anything because they're not, they're not scored in any way. The NRA never scores conservation votes. They score whatever nakedly partisan gun votes. And, and they don't even really, I believe, they don't even really care about guns. I tell some stories in the book, true stories that hit close to home. 
where it's not even really about wise gun policy. It's what about what you can do to increase the political pressure cooker so that partisan power can be gained. It's, it's just a tool. And when that happens, things like public lands, conservation, other things that we hold dear, um, frankly, I think anything that you hold dear, anything, um, reproductive rights, the environment, anything now that is fought over is made worse by the politics that the gun industry perfected, created, perfected, and then handed off to the right. This all or nothing, zero sum game, like everything that we're fighting over now is impacted by that. Yeah. And like, I'll never forget shortly after the um, 16 election, go into a store that I often buy ammo, I buy other things. And the owner said, you know, I'm really going to miss Barack Obama. <laughs> I'm like, really? You know, because I've known him. We don't talk much politics. And I said, that surprises me. Uh, and he goes, look, in all the years that I've owned this store, I sold more guns and I sold more ammo under Barack Obama than the literally like three decades that he had had. You talk about radicalization. Um, like for me, I still struggle. And, and look, nothing happened under eight years of President Obama to restrict Second Amendment or gun rights. Um, is it all part of sort of the profit motive or is it bigger than that? It became accidentally, I believe, wrapped up in this tornado. <clears throat> and I don't know, I don't know where, from what direction it started blowing. I don't know, but profit, more profit begets, well, I'll back up a bit. It got to the point where conspiracy, racism, hate, that created, obviously with Barack Obama, who I, you know, there's a chapter in the book called the best gun salesman in America, because that's what the entire gun industry called Barack Obama. While everybody was trying to get him unelected in the firearms industry, they were also calling him the best gun salesman in America, because um, I, I have to go back and look, but you know, when I got into the industry, three and a half, four million guns a year were sold by the time Obama um, left office somewhere in the 16 and a half, 17, 18 million guns per year were sold yeah. at much higher prices. And so we're talking billions. I mean, companies went public. Uh, huge retailers were, were, were blew up over guns. I mean, it's, it's a monster. Guns and gun stock, you know, stocks from gun companies were wrapped into 401ks and retirement funds. I mean, it became a massive sort of monetary thing. So where is it profit? Is it hate? Is it fear? Is it conspiracy? Is it politics? I don't know what they all feed on each other. And if you need proof of that, um, the only time that has exceeded, so San, the, the time after Sandy Hook, when the most hatred and fear, um, you know, conspiracy about that these little kids were somehow crisis actors, a detestable thing to even utter. Um, Sandy, after Sandy Hook sales exploded, the only time in that, that sales has ever have ever exceeded that were when George Floyd was murdered and Black Lives Matter rallies happened and COVID happened at the same time. So if you think back in your life yeah. to the time when you felt the most tumult in this society, the most hate, the most fear, the most conspiracy theory, that's been the last what 18 months, right? Like that's it's we've we've seen some some pretty some pretty rabid um, tumult in our society that corresponds perfectly with the highest yeah. gun sales rates um that last year dwarf obama's years the last year almost 24 million guns were wow. sold again when i started three and a half million guns a year in the last year during all the tumult of covid and george floyd and the race riots and trump fueling it all almost 24 million you know you say in the book um that Trumpism was developed by the gun industry. And you say you weren't surprised by the rise of Trump and the transformation on the right. And there's a lot of few specific examples in the book. I think that might be, you know, one of the many threads of this quilt in this book is that's an interesting statement to make that 
it really was developed by the gun industry. So tell a little bit about some of those examples that got you there. Well, if I think about the sort of core tenets of what has become this proto-fascist state on the right that we see now in our country, the core tenets essentially are hatred, conspiracy theory. Um, and I'll give, you an, I'll give you an example of the conspiracy theory, right? I think QAnon was developed by the NRA accidentally. Why? Because the sort of things that I heard the NRA say kind of accidentally 10, 15, 18 years ago, for instance, Barack Obama is going to rewrite the Constitution. I think LaPierre is up on a stage and he's saying this. I think he's almost kind of like, you know, putting his finger in the air, and, but people cheer and he's kind of like, holy crap, they believed it. Well, let's try another one. Um, Barack Obama is going to outlaw hunting ammunition and they cheer. They believe it, you know, and it goes on and on and on. You know, Barack Obama is going to disavow every citizen's right to own a handgun and they cheer. They believe it. And so it really shouldn't be a surprise that somewhere down the line. Unhinged people show up in Washington, D.C. because they believe Hillary Clinton has sex slaves in a pizza parlor. Really, is it that much crazier than than Wayne LaPierre saying that Barack Obama is going to rewrite the Constitution. I don't know if you read the Constitution, but the president can't rewrite the Constitution. It's, it's, it's unconstitutional. Um, so I saw that sort of thing build up. I talk about the sort of casual acceptance of racism. I don't think that the people I worked with in the industry were really racist. Like in, like in their minds, they weren't racist. I didn't see white hoods marching up and down the, train, the trade shows. But I tell lots of stories about the acceptance and cheering of casual racism as a tool to divide, as a tool to make us hate each other. And then if you fast forward to, um, you know, NRA TV and the Dana Locia's famous, you know, I called it the hate your neighbor ad, but it's called the clinched fist of truth, where essentially we had run out of things to hate. So now we need to hate our neighbors, right? That all foreshadows Trump and the rise of Trump and this sort of fascist thing we're looking at now on the right, because what we have to drive people to the polls now are the very same things that the NRA stumbled on to drive people to buy guns. Yeah. I don't remember if it was uh, Washington Post or Wall Street Journal or somebody was out interviewing me. Um, and we got into guns and they go, well, how many guns do you own? And I said, you know, the beauty is, it's none of your damn business, yeah. nor should it ever be. And, you know, we're in a country, you were raised in Kansas, I was raised in Montana. We're in a country where 40% of households in our country have one or more firearms. Now that's US wide, I think is the whole statistic. Montana, it's a heck of a lot bigger. I've met, more than my share of folks that just don't understand gun ownership. They don't understand a hunting ethic, a self-defense ethic. They're like, I don't know why people have to own guns. As we talk about sort of the radicalization on the right for a better thing, or those that are making guns just a political issue, how do we help educate those on the other side that are like, I don't understand a Ryan Bussey or a Steve Bullock or folks like that that feel like owning a firearm is something that I get to do and it's none of your damn business, reporter. So I think, you know, I, I, try, to, I try to address that in the beginning of the book, but also I see a, a, a question here that I'll hit. Um, I think it's incumbent on gun owners to stand up for the same sort of responsibility that you that you and I both know, Governor, is so critical to maintaining these rights, including gun rights. And um, I like to say, you know, I, I've told folks that I had a religion professor in college who explained to me once, he said, look, if we have a Statue of Liberty on one coast, we need a Statue of Responsibility on the other coast. And I think that is the sort of thing that gun owners, for most of the existence of the United States, save these last few radicalized 12 or 15 years, have understood and embraced perfectly well. In fact, the industry embraced this for a long time. And I'm gonna weave in an answer to a, another question here that we have in our Q&A uh, about Zumbo. Um, Jim Zumbo was a longtime writer 
Um, he had written 23 books. He was a celebrity in the industry and he dared to speak out against AR 15s because he believed um, proliferating them in society would be irresponsible. He didn't say ban them. He didn't say outlaw them. And to your point, what you own is your business, right? But he said it's irresponsible to do the sorts of things that now have been done with AR 15s. Um, it didn't matter that Zumbo had written 23 books. It didn't matter that he was an, a longtime editor and respected celebrity for outdoor life. It didn't matter that he had a blog for Remington. It didn't matter that he was sponsored with Cabela's. You want to see cancel culture. That guy lost everything in four days, everything. And every other person in the industry that has spoken out like that has lost everything too. And um, to your question, uh, the, the, the person who typed this question, it's worse now. It's way worse now. Um, it, and it's, it's not going to get any better until responsible gun owners stand up and do the sorts of things that impress upon doubters that Steve is, is referencing here, that we're not all like these crazy people who are marching through state capitals, threatening to kidnap governors with loaded AR-15s. That is so far past responsible. I mean, in my opinion, that sort of armed intimidation should be illegal every place in this country. A civil society does not operate when one party is standing over the other with an, with, armed with 30 round magazines. So to, to what I say to, you know, to people who don't understand it is if gun owners want to maintain these rights and want to impress upon people that don't understand guns, um, how important they are to us, we need to stand up against the stuff that is not responsible. And it is everywhere today. Um, again, it's marching through the Capitol with AR-15 flags. The guy that was trying to zip tie, they call him zip tie guy, was running through the Senate trying to find senators to zip tie. He had a black rifle coffee hat on. Kyle Rittenhouse proudly wore his black rifle coffee shirt. He's getting ready to go to a trial next week, and he's now a celebrity in the firearms industry because he owned the libs. He killed people with his AR-15, right? These are not responsible things to celebrate. And my, gun, and my book lays out how we got here, how, how we got from a place where we celebrated responsibility to now we celebrate people like Kyle Rittenhouse. It's just, it's just incredibly dangerous. So the challenge too, in some ways though, and fear is right, a much greater motivator than dang near anything else. I think that the capitalization of fear of they're gonna take your guns away or X, Y, and Z, has moved more people than I would like to believe. Yeah. And gun owners have a responsibility and understand that responsibility. I know the book is, for the most part, here's who I am, here's what happened over the career, here's why I had to leave it. Here are some of the things that everybody should know about it. But what do we do? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think that I think that so much of this begins. This radicalization didn't just plop onto the scene, right? We didn't we didn't just wake up to however many percentage of the people or tens of millions of people being this radicalized. It happened over time, and in my opinion, it happened because responsible people didn't insist on the things that they knew were right. They let things pass. Good people, I did. I tell stories in the book. I mean, I, I, I'm certainly not perfect. I tell stories in the book about how I wished I would have done more, how I experienced racism and I didn't speak up like I should have spoken up at the time. But there's, there's something that everyone can do. You know, I, I pejoratively have this character, you know, crazy Uncle Bob, right? But when you're at Thanksgiving and Uncle Bob say, says vaccines don't work and Steve Bullock wants to steal your guns, you don't have to just take another bite of mashed potatoes. You can say, no, sorry, that's not true. Um, we can speak up. We can do these things. Um, and, and I think that when we will start to see a new a, a rising of the sort of centrist, the radical centrist, which I think so many of us are, we're not all one thing or another. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm proudly progressive, but I'm also a gun owner. Um, I'm, a, I'm a responsible gun owner. And I'm, I'm, I'm okay with stepping up and saying, these things aren't true. Conspiracy isn't right. It's not okay to wish for civil war. It's not okay to, to cheer Kyle Rittenhouse who kills people with a borrowed AR-15. It's not okay. Um, I think we'd be surprised how much change we can make. 
I also think we do need a couple legislative fixes. I think we need to pass universal background checks and we need to outlaw intimidation, open carry intimidation with guns. It's just, I fear that we're headed towards a place that's, you know, you think about the Sue Frazier here mentions that she was at the, the same rally in Kalispell. Um, there was enough guns and ammo there to kill every single person at that rally three or four times over. And if a couple things would have gone wrong, that would have happened. There were armed people with fingers on the trigger with multiple 30 round magazines all over the place at a, at a political rally. I mean, we cannot allow that. That's, that, that, that is, that, that's going to lead to play that sooner or later, the match is going to touch the gasoline and it's going to be an ugly, ugly thing. Yeah, and you speak of like universal background checks where if you do polling, even in Montana, I think it's still 80, 90% of Montana and say, look, same way I bought my gun. Yeah. Other uh, should, right? There's everyone presumably wants to keep guns out of the wrong hands. Um, so some of this is really common sense. Do you ever think there's an opportunity like to look at guns and firearms, not from a political issue, but more a public health issue? Like there are things that might make a difference along the way. I think that we need to be responsible as a society. And I just think this, this insistence on maximum freedom all the time, I liken what we're doing with guns to essentially think of it like, think of it like it's a school zone. And essentially we're saying, I don't care if there's kids in the street, I want to go 80 and I'm going to drive 80 because I'm late to work. Now, slowing down to 25 does limit your freedom a little bit, but we do these sorts of things because we have to operate in a civil operating democracy. Okay. Um, and, and so as a public health issue, yes, we need to look at it as a public health issue. And these are pro-gun things because none of our rights are going to exist if we keep marching towards this sort of crazy armed civil war or wh whatever this is that, that guns are at the center of now. Um, these numbered amendments will be the last thing we're worried about. Um, and so as, as responsible people, like we've always done, we need to stand up and insist upon this. And if we can't insist upon it through our own volition, if we can't make ourselves do it and our community do it, then we, then we need to have legislation that does it. That's, that's the way the country works. It, it, <laughs> the curious thing is, it's, I mean, it was only in my time in public office that Second Amendment was even recognized as an individual right. Um, right. And there is no right in our constitution that there isn't some, like, look, I don't have, no one has unfettered First Amendment rights, right? The law school would always be that you can't yell fire in a crowded movie theater. Right. That we can protect these rights well also recognizing that there's the possibility for responsibility to be injected in, I think. Exactly. There's, you know, this, there's a dangerous movement afoot now in the firearms world called Second Amendment absolutism. And the idea is that the, the focus on the part of the Second Amendment that says shall not be infringed. And they believe literally that the second amendment shall not be infringed. Apparently that means your fourth grader needs a howitzer and we need to have battles on the playground. That means that your neighbor needs an A-10 warthog and can strafe you on the way to work. Like this is silly talk. It's silly talk, but it's just, it's ways to drum up sort of electioneering pressure and more pressure in our, in our world and in our society. And if you haven't noticed, we, we don't need any more pressure in our, in our society right now. Um, and it, it's just time you know, the book, in the end, it's just a plea. It's a, it's a, it's an honest explanation about how we got here. So everybody kind of, they scratch their head like, holy crap, how is it that we ended up with armed people in Michigan or people marching on the Capitol with gun flags? Like this book will explain it all to you, but it's really a plea for all of us who know that's not right to just stand up and be counted, to take the mic away from the people who have it because they don't represent the majority. They represent a loud minority. You know, the only one in your family that I like more than you, of course, is Sarah. Mm -hmm. um, and you referenced earlier that 
it was kind of Sarah's pushing you to be all that you could be to do good and to do well that got you to take this track. Um, And look, how do you or your family feel about threats now that you're getting just because you wrote what I don't believe is an anti-gun book. It's just like, here was my experience. Yeah, so I came in to the house not long ago, and I'd probably been hunting or something, but Lander was sitting at a computer said, Dad, do you know that there's like 150 pages and videos and YouTube channels about how you should be beheaded and killed and dismembered? And, and so... Am I getting the threats? Yeah. Um, but frankly, I've been standing up against the industry for a while. And, and in some ways, that's not a new thing for me. I think you're right that I'm very lucky to have the family I do and very lucky to have the wife that I have. She pushed me to do the right thing for a long time, um, probably long before I did it. Um, and you mentioned doing good and doing well. There was a time, I think maybe my scales were upside down on that, right? But she never has she never has lost sight of doing good. Um, and, and they need to be intermixed. I understand, but we need to do good. And she's always pushed me to do that. So are we getting threats? Yeah. Can it be ugly? Yeah. But I mean, just before we hopped on here, um, gal, um, owns a large, her family owns a large multi-family or multi-generational ranch in West Texas. I don't know her from Adam, right? She sends me a very long, heartfelt message um, from rural West Texas about how she just finished the book, how she loves it. She can't believe how, how you know, poignant, touching, and how illustrative it is about, and she bought five copies. I'm like, well, why didn't you buy 10? But whatever, she <laughs> bought five. Um, but, you know, to give to her family members. I, I'm getting these messages all the time from unexpected places that make me really believe that this sort of radical center that I'm talking about, it's out there. And these people want to stand up and they want to be represented and they're tired of the crazy loud people with the microphone. And so I'm, I'm really heartened by that. I, I knew the hate was coming, but, but to, I'm heartened by the people across the country. Um, yes, progressives, of course, but also people from right and center right that, that I never saw coming. Yeah. Um, Tagging off of sort of this doesn't answer one of the questions um, in the chat, but there have been Dick's, there have been Walmart, there's been other national chains that have turned around and said, we're done. <laughs> Meaning like we're done selling ARs. Yep. Can market forces change this along the way? I mean, if enough Dick's and Walmart's and others come and say, there's a quiet communal pressure yep. to say that, look, we no longer need to be selling these. We no longer need to have these sell. Can market forces change this by sort of the quiet communal pressure or is does the system only work by the loudest anymore? And the well, most so to your point, there was a time when market forces did exist. And most a lot of people think that AR-15s were banned during the assault weapons ban. That's not true. AR-15s were not banned. AR-15s with add-on features were banned, but you could buy AR-15s and sell AR-15s as much as you wanted to all through the 10 years of the assault weapons ban. They didn't sell and retailers like Dick's and Walmart didn't carry them. And there weren't big sections of them in Cabela's and Bass Pro and everywhere else. And they weren't on flags and on t-shirts and on the zip tie guy's hat. Why? Because market forces and society decided they weren't responsible to do that. So you ask, can we do it? Well, we've already done it. <laughs> we used to do it. It wasn't very long ago we did it. We could do that again. Um, and Dix was, you know, Dix was booted out of NSSF, even though Ed Stack, the CEO, and Dix, uh, their 800 plus stores were the, among, they're the largest sporting goods retailer in the country and among the largest um, gun retailer in the country. And they still sell plenty of guns and ammo. But just because they didn't sell the right gun, the symbolic one, they were booted out of NSSF. Their membership was revoked. Um, and I believe that when an idea is has to be has to be supported with that kind of totalitarian fragility, frankly, it's not a good idea. 
no no good idea no good idea has to be police stated to exist right if you can if you can't put your ideas up to scrutiny then it's not a very good idea and so i think that again i really believe we are on a precipice and I, I don't have anything against an AR-15 per se, a bunch of metal stamped together, a barrel, some plastic, whatever. I do have something against it being the central tool or the central symbol of radicalization for our country. Yeah. That's dangerous. Yeah. That, I mean, we, 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 there's something screwed up there. Ryan, I've sure enjoyed this conversation as I've always enjoyed time with you. Um, Lauren, do you want any part of this? Um, I can certainly ask some of the audience questions. Sure. Yeah. Or I can as well. That's the. I mean, have at it. Yeah. Go ahead. I think, I think, um, yeah, I think just for the audience's uh, reference, um, we don't want to go any, you know, too far past sure. about 815. So we, we, we can keep going if you guys are up for it. Sounds good. Uh, one question, um, thank you. I've been so disappointed in traditional gun owners, hunters, et cetera, and not speaking up against the change in the NRA from a hunter safety organization to an organization whose primary constituents are the ammo and gun manufacturing industries. How do we I think, so that? I think I'm going to, I'm going to quibble with that. Um, yeah. And I explain in the book, and you and I often hear. Um, certainly, don't, I certainly don't want to offend Lauren because I know she's a very trusted NPR celebrity, right? But um, I often hear on NPR things like um, things like that, like the NRA just works for the gun manufacturers. I can tell you this through the through most of my career, it was exactly the opposite. Exactly, Did the gun opposite. manufacturers work for the NRA. Yeah, absolutely, and so. Um, Everybody walked around on pins and needles. Every firearms manufacturer walked around on pins and needles uh, as to what they were, if they were pleasing the NRA, if they were doing anything to anger the NRA. It wasn't the opposite it, because political power, partisan political power, um, naked power grabs were more important. It just so happened that everything that increased the naked partisan political grabs also increased gun sales. It, it, it was maybe accidental, right? But if you think about what, if you think about what makes people fearful and run to the polls, that's also what makes people fearful and run to buy a gun. And so, um, it's it's not that gun gun manufacturers. In fact, gun manufacturers sought out like the blessing of the NRA. Um, they worried about condemnation from the NRA. It wasn't the other way around. Which I think Ryan will actually be another one of those threads in this book that will cause both a lot of discussion light bulbs, yeah. right? Because one wants to think of it as essentially a trade organization for the manufacturers and that the trade organization being the NRA would do anything the manufacturers want. But in the book, you're almost saying, look, the manufacturers would do dang near anything the NRA wants. Absolutely. In fact, you know, I won't give this way, but there's a illustrious story at the begin near the beginning of the book about how the NRA sort of put its stamp on everything. And once everybody understood that you did not step out of line or you would be, you know, it comes to be called zumboed, right? You're going to be fired. You're going to be run out of town. You're going to be ridiculed, tarred and feathered, whatever. Then the sort of big public contributions to the NRA really kicked in. And the NRA has what's called, I, I know it's a, a bit odd, but it's called the NRA Golden Jacket. And the NRA Golden Jacket is for anybody, any individual who has contributed more than a million dollars to the NRA. And all the big industry executives now have NRA Golden Jackets. Do they like giving away a million dollars? No, they have them because they need, they need to pay homage to the king, right? That's to the, to the thing that runs the industry. And it's, it's almost ludicrous to think that it's that transparent, but it's that transparent. You know, a question which maybe I'll revise a little bit. The question was, as the body count keeps rising in our country, do you believe there'll be meaningful gun sense legislation without repealing the Second Amendment? I mean, I will begin from the premise that we're not ever going to repeal the Second Amendment, nor would I suggest that we should. Maybe I would rephrase of 
does there remain a possibility for meaningful gun sense legislation at the federal level? I think it's a very difficult environment right here, but I guess, and as you know, Steve, very difficult to think about it. We can't even get an ATF director um, through nomination, through the nomination process. Um, I don't think there's going to be, I don't think there's going to be any legislation that comes down the pike, not now at least. I do think that, um, I do think the sort of conversation we have about changing the political calculus, though, can lead to a change in that. Until we do that, though, until we stand up, until reasonable gun owners stand up and say, no, I'm taking the mic back, then then nothing will change. Because right now, the political calculus is that that this small, small slice of the electorate, this two or three or four percent slice of the electorate who votes 100 percent in lockstep, that they will shift important races a percent or two. Um, when we shift that a little bit, then things will change. Yeah, my moments of optimism is it wasn't that long ago that like Mansion Toomey, right? Yep. The bill was there, and that's for those who don't know, Toomey's Republican out of uh, Pennsylvania, Joe Manchin's Democrat from West Virginia, had been working on a background checks bill. Yep. Like, if we can ever get so that some folks feel like their backs will be had, I'll give it that the filibuster or the requirements and things are difficult, but there is more commonality. And I still believe, right? Most gun owners, there's great commonality. Yep, absolutely. It shouldn't be beyond the notion. Yep, there's no doubt about it. There's, it's, it's just, again, we're in this very dangerous political time across our politics where the tyranny of the minority is ruling our politics and all of our policy. And, you know, back to the through line of the book, it's not really a shock to me because I witnessed the development of this idea where the tyranny of the minority would rule everything. And, you know, it started in the industry. It was handed off to Trump and Trumpism. And, and I think, I hope I make a convincing argument for that in the book. But um, when we undo that, we will get back to <laughs> making progress on yeah. things. It's an interesting question that isn't necessarily an easy one. I'll add my editorial comments to it as well. It's the question was, what do you have to say about ARs being used as incentive mechanism for fundraising, membership recruitment in the world of conservation? I personally don't see what tactical style guns have to do with public lands access and sporting activities, such as hunting and fishing. Could you speak to the divide between hunters and what guns are appropriate for hunting? My only editorializing on that would be that, look, there are some ARs, if you will, high-end ARs that my understanding is can be fairly incredible for hunting, but those are guns that aren't the ones that you're going to be necessarily buying. But the greater, meaning that sort of the average retail guy uh, but the greater question is, if conservation is using ARs now, is that incentive for fundraising, membership, recruitment? Are we going in the right direction, or what is that divide along the way, and how do we sort of elevate or illuminate that? I think that ARs, generally speaking, and, and just so everybody understands, I don't think there's a state in the union that doesn't have very strict magazine capacity restrictions for hunting guns. Okay. So um, Governor Bullock's correct. There are some AR-15s that are used for hunting. Most are not. The vast majority are not. The most vast majority are not intended for that. The vast majority are not named for that. There's a, there's a gun called now the Wilson Urban Super Sniper, which I'm pretty sure wow. is not, is not, I mean, believe it or not, it's actually called that. I don't know if you have to put a lot of brain power into guessing what the urban super sniper might be used for, but it certainly is not hunting, uh, not in, not in, uh, not in any acceptable way anyway. But what I was going to say is there's magazine restrictions and for hunting for firearms in every state. And most of them are very small. They certainly are not 10 rounds and 30 rounds uh, as is now the practice of most AR 15s, even some larger than that. I think the normalization of ARs as this sort of cultish, political, sort of machismo symbol 
finding their way into um, fundraising. I've seen it for churches. Of course, I live in Kalispell, but um, I've seen it for churches. I've seen it for youth groups. I think it's dangerous. I don't think we should do it. I'm not, I'm not saying that AR-15 should be banned or should go away or should be, you know, but nor should we normalize this sort of political symbol that is the central organizing symbol for the Proud Boys and the three percenters and, you know, white nationalist groups. I, I don't know why we want to add any fuel to that. Now, I am not just because I think highly of you, hope that there are more of the folks like the woman from West Texas that said, I'm gonna buy a bunch of these books. To me, it's not just about selling your books, but it's about being part of this greater conversation about kind of where we've been, where we are today and where we can be. So certainly, of course, encourage everybody that joined us tonight to buy the book. But as we get close to the 815 hour um, and we've run 15 minutes over, for those that haven't read the book yet, I guess give me the moments of pessimism and the moments of optimism and what you think more than selling books, this can add to the overall conversation that desperately needs to be had. Um, appreciate the kind words. And I most appreciate um, probably the most valuable part of the book is this blurb. There's a blurb from, from Governor Bullock in here. Um, that's probably the best writing in the whole book, right? Um, <laughs> But for me, the optimism is that there's a lot more of us than we think there are. We walk around our towns and our communities and our shopping centers and our gas stations, and we see this sort of in-your-face bumper sticker, big flag. You know, those, those things are there to keep us silent. They're not there. They're there to make sure that we don't join up together, that we don't, we don't take that apart. Um, and, and we, we are the majority, the, the reasonable members of society are the majority. I believe that. Um, if that's not the case, we're really in a world of hurt. We're, we are really in a world of hurt. I just, I just don't believe that decent people don't make up the majority of this country. And so we have to get past these big flags and bumper stickers and all these things meant to intimidate us into silence. And when I see, when I get these messages and these, I have people write me letters written out. I, I get text messages. I have, get the direct messages. I get, you know, everything. It's, it, it really is um, heartening to believe that this thing that I hope I believe, right, about that the, that, the company, that the country is composed of really thoughtful, responsible, moderate people, I believe that to be the case. And I, and, and I hope that by writing this book, maybe I'm the first one in this room that stands up and says, okay, I'll stick my hand up and say it. But I, I, I think there's going to be a lot of other people that, that stick their hand up with me. Well, Ryan, I personally appreciate you putting, sticking your hand up, and it is a hand that's stuck up from experiences that many of us haven't had. Um, and I do think it will be a meaningful part of the conversation and potential for change going forward. Certainly appreciate all of you joining as well. Um, I know I'm getting up at 4.30 in the morning with my 15-year-old son to get the second day of opening season tomorrow. So I won't keep all of you any longer, uh, but I'll turn it back over to you, Lauren. Thanks so much. Um, such an enormous thank you to the two of you, Ryan, Governor Bullock, for this really necessary conversation this evening, for joining the festival with this event. Thank you again, audience, for being here, asking really insightful questions. Um, and thank you again to our event sponsors, Arts Missoula, MissoulaEvents.net, this event's collector's edition sponsor, the Whitefish Review, uh, as well as Humanities Montana and the Dennis and Phyllis Washington Foundation. Um, I'm sure many in the audience noticed I was throwing that, that purchase link in the, in the chat. Um, definitely go out, buy this book, and if you can, buy it from Fact and Fiction here in Missoula or online at factandfictionbooks.com, where you should definitely use MBF at checkout so that 20% of that sale comes back to us. Um, thank you again for joining us, Ryan, Governor Bullock. Um, I hope everyone here has a wonderful evening.
Thanks so much, Lauren. And thanks everybody for being on the call and um, caring about these things. Thank you.